Hi, my name is Pete Burak. I'm a husband, father of four, and a parishioner at Christ the King Parish in Ann Arbor. I'm also a member of the Realign Resources to Mission Committee of the Diocese of Lansing. What exactly is that? Well, this is us, and as you can see, we are both clergy and laity, men and women, drawn from the urban and rural parts of our 10 county diocese. Last year, Bishop Earl Boyer invited us to review the resources of the Diocese of Lansing in order to recommend to him new and better ways of engaging in the mission of Jesus Christ and his Holy Church across our 10 county dioceses. During this presentation, I'll take you through what we have discovered so far and, most importantly, explain how you can input into the process. First, though, let us begin by placing ourselves in the presence of Almighty God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Lord and our God, we firmly believe that you are here, that you see us, that you hear us. We adore you with profound reverence. We ask you for the pardon of our sins and the grace to make this time together fruitful. Our Mother Immaculate, St. Joseph, our Father and Lord, our guardian angels, intercede for us. Amen. Let's talk about you. Why is your feedback to this presentation so important? Because informed by your feedback, the next step for the Realign Resources for Mission process is to begin drawing up a range of concrete proposals which will come back to you for further comment next year before going to Bishop Boye after Easter 2021. Below this video, you will find a link to an online survey. Step by step, it will take you through the key principles of this presentation. At each stage, you have an opportunity to express your hopes and fears and to tell us anything our community needs to know and to ask us any question you want to ask, any question, anything we need to know. All feedback will be recorded and read. It is also very much appreciated as Bishop Boye now explains. Imagine, imagine a parish, imagine a pastor who finds his ministry happy, holy, and dynamic. Imagine though, he is not alone. Imagine he is supported by other clergy who together share the joys and sorrows of the sacred priesthood along with the burdens and blessings of parish life. Imagine those priests work creatively and collaboratively in pursuing their apostolic ambitions with talented, motivated, and faithful lay staff. Imagine that together they help form, serve, and inspire all the people of the parish, the families, the young adults, the elderly, the poor, the sick. Imagine all these people, clergy and lay, are formed by the Holy Spirit into a community of missionary disciples. Imagine they then bring the person of Jesus Christ to a contemporary society in desperate need of his healing love. Imagine. My dear brothers and sisters, just imagine what would happen if we actually did all that. I believe we'd completely transform our diocese. We would certainly introduce our family and friends to the deepest happiness, meaning, and peace that this life can offer. We would also help them get to heaven in the next. Our earthly existence has no greater purpose, and yet often parishes lack the vision, structure, and leadership to realize, realize this ideal. That is why last year I drew together this group of both lay and clergy from across our 10 county dioceses to help us chart a new way forward for our diocese. They are called the Realign Resources for Mission Committee. So far, they have prayed, they have surveyed, they have studied the data, and here is what they have found. In terms of priests, often our priests are so consumed with the day-to-day -day challenges of running a parish that they have nothing left for creative missionary work. Often our priests feel isolated or alone. Often they are being asked to pastor a flock without the resources needed for truly transformative evangelization. As regards parish staff, the committee has found that often our parishes are eking by with only a few lay ministers who are overworked and underpaid. Hence, many important ministry areas do not have the necessary leadership and funding to evangelize and catechize successfully. As regards the lay faithful, the committee has found that our laymen and women have a great desire to grow in their spiritual lives and to evangelize. However, 
They often don't feel intellectually equipped or spiritually prepared or even practically supported by their parish to become missionary disciples of Jesus Christ in the world. So where do we go from here? Well, the Realign Resources for Mission Committee has until next spring to make its recommendations to me. Before they do that, though, they need to talk to you. They need to hear from you. What are your hopes for your parish? What are your fears? What does the Realign Resources for Mission Committee need to know? What practical advice can you give them? Members of the committee will be coming to your parish in coming months. The exact date will be advertised in your parish bulletin. It's important you take this opportunity to speak up. I know firsthand the sadness of family members drifting from the practice of their Catholic faith. Christ, too, weeps over every lost sheep. He wants us to go find them, bring them back to him, and to make disciples of all other people as well. And he wants us to do it here and now. Hence, we need to step up our prayer, increase our penance, and then we need to act. So please, do get involved. Thank you, and God bless you. As the bishop suggests, it is imperative that we align our resources towards mission. So that begs the question, what is our mission? He is our mission. Jesus Christ true God and true man. And he gave us a great commission just prior to his ascension into heaven. Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and then the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So why is that important? Because as Bishop Boyer just explained, in the person of Jesus Christ, we introduce our family and friends to the deepest happiness meaning and peace that this life can offer. We also help them get to heaven in the next. Our earthly existence has no greater purpose. So, how are we getting on with our mission of making disciples of all nations? Let's be honest about it. Let's look at some vital statistics. This is Sunday Mass attendance in the Diocese of Lansing from 2001 to 2019, down 37%. Meanwhile, this is the Diocese of Lansing's sacramental statistics from 2003 to 2019. First Communions, down 56%. Infant baptisms are down 54%. RCIA is down 70%. And marriages are down 55%. Finally, the number of priests in the Diocese of Lansing. At present, we have 72 parishes and 94 active priests, but with 12 in non-parish assignments, for example, hospital chaplaincy. 32 of those active priests will be able to enter senior status by 2026. And it's anticipated that ordinations will not fully replace that 32. So amid that statistical doom and gloom, where do we find our hope? This has to be our answer, doesn't it? Again, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ crucified, Jesus Christ truly present in the Holy Eucharist. This is the foundation upon which Bishop Boyer's road to realigning resources has been built. So, let's look at the steps taken so far. In 2012, Bishop Boyer publishes his pastoral letter entitled, Go and Announce the Gospel of the Lord. From 2014 to 2018, he convened three diocesan assemblies focusing on the household of faith, the lost sheep, and the court of the Gentiles. In short, that's practicing Catholics, lapsed Catholics, and those who have never been Catholic. Finally, in 2018, Bishop Boyer oversaw a diocesan strategic planning process. How did the bishop describe the outcome of that? And this is what he said, and I quote, one of the three important priorities discerned by these strategic planning groups was the need to realign our human and other resources to better position us to engage in the mission of Jesus to build up the kingdom of God in the Diocese of Lansing. Hence, the creation of our Realign Resources for Mission Committee last year. And what have we done over the last year? Well, primarily we have prayed. We have discussed, 
we have discerned, informed though, by a, quite a bit of research and data. We have analyzed five years of parish data, such as financial, sacramental, demographic statistics, with the consultancy firm Veracruz, have helped to analyze our Catholic schools. We have surveyed over 20,000 parishioners via the Disciple Maker Index, over 200 key parish figures via a key parish leader survey, and 71 clergy via the Called for More Priest Preferences and Passion Survey. We have consulted with many other dioceses around the country and beyond who are engaged in restructuring. And we have interviewed many experts specializing in church renewal and growth. Catholic Leadership Institute, Amazing Parish, Divine Renovation, Acts 29. So is this thing all about data? Hello, my name is Father Matthias Thalen. I'm the pastor of St. Patrick's in Brighton, and I am the chair of the Realignment of Resources to Mission Committee. One of the things that we're very convinced about is that we, we don't understand data unless we have a vision in which to understand that data. And so what is the mission of the church? What does the church exist to do? The church exists to evangelize, to make disciples of, of, of the nations, and to make disciples, period. So every parish has its own, its own mission from Jesus himself. And as a result, we see the data of people coming to Mass, people uh, receiving the sacraments. We see the data of, of where the priests are, where the populations are. We see all this data in light of how healthy are we and how can we shift what we're doing to be more effective in caring for the people of God, maintaining kind of like who we are as communities of missionary disciples, and how can we be more effective in making inroads into our culture to make more disciples. So it's a very complex process, and I think as we take in a lot of this data, um, both it's data on the ground, both national data, um, and data with regard to our specific parishes, with the Disciple Maker Index and some of the other benchmarks that we have, we can get a good snapshot of the, uh, of the communities that need to be realigned. We can get a good snapshot of the schools. We get a good snapshot of how all of this fits together so we can present to the bishop recommendations that are, are both data-driven but also mission-driven and therefore vision for what the church can be in our 10-county diocese. One of the great challenges of, of this process is the temptation to think that we're just simply rearranging a structure, that we're just restructuring the diocese. And if we think that we're going to restructure the diocese and have different results, we're kind of fooling ourselves. We need to form cultures that support and, and buoy up, if you may, the, the efforts of mission, of evangelization. So we need to change the cultures of the parishes and the diocese. Um, what that means is, is essentially having someone to help shape and form that culture. And that ultimately is a question of leadership. Both the leadership of the bishop and the leadership of the individual pastors and principals in the diocese to help shape a culture in which evangelization can thrive. One of the great dangers of us thinking in terms of evangelization is to think that we can do it by program. Think that we can do it simply by having a nice kind of process in place. Well, those processes and programs are very important. What really needs to happen is that in each of these parishes and communities, there needs to be a culture which fosters and rewards and celebrates the very conditions that make evangelization possible. Because if you don't have the culture in place, you're never going to be able to get off the ground and moving into a missionary mindset. And leaders are the ones who shape culture. They're the ones who keep, there's a, they're the ones who drive a certain accountability on where, whether or not we're going to move into a different type of, of parish that's more missionary. So without the pastors being on board, without the pastors having captured a compelling vision and communicating that vision to the people of God, we're never going to have the culture necessary to support evangelization efforts. And therefore, without good leadership, we're not going to be able to truly move forward as a diocese. That was Father Matthias Thalen. So based upon all that research and the data and the vision casting, here are the Realign Resources for Mission Committee's five key findings. One, demographics and decline are the occasion to restructure, but not our core problem. Our core problem is too often being insufficiently on mission. Two, structural change is not enough to get parishes more on mission. Instead, a change in parish culture is required. Three, culture change, though, is hard. 
and requires sustained and effective leadership by a pastor working collaboratively with others. Four, at present, too many priests and parishioners are not thriving. Too often, disciples are not being made while priests are tired and isolated. And five, structures should serve mission, not the other way around. We can all be tempted to conserve structure that no longer are fit for mission. That's our key findings. Based upon these, we have then developed a vision for what a healthy parish in the Diocese of Lansing should look like. Here's what we think we should be able to say as we become more fit for mission. A healthy parish in the Diocese of Lansing is one, led by priests who are striving for health and holiness. Two, equips and empowers parish staff. Three, makes and forms missionary disciples. And four, seeks the lost and serves the poor. So let's go through those four principles, one by one, and in a bit more detail. You can give comment upon each of these principles via the online survey, which, as said, you'll find linked below this video. Okay, principle one. A healthy parish in the Diocese of Lansing is led by priests striving for health and holiness. Here's what that particular vision should look like. In the Diocese of Lansing, priests support one another. They live in community, even if not in the same rectory. Multiple priests serve one parish together. Ongoing formation, mentoring, and coaching is provided to diocesan clergy. Priests are unified with and accountable to the bishop. A pastor has the charism of leadership and has a parish leadership team. And finally, other priests operate out of their particular charisms and gifts too. The, the truth is, is that every single priest is gifted differently and every priest has his own passions uh, in, in ministry. And sometimes there are priests who would rather not be the head honcho, the guy in charge, but they'd rather serve in a different way. And we've already seen that among the priests of our diocese. There are other people who are very gifted at administration, very gifted at leadership, very gifted at leading other priests, having priests come alongside them and working together to be on mission. And so already, just as we see this difference in the body of Christ among the laity, we see a uniqueness of gifting among the priests. And when priests are using their gifts, and they're, uh, when they're using what God, the gifts that God gives to them, and they're seeing those gifts bear fruit, priests come alive. And when they're most alive, they're most effective. That's what we want for the Diocese of Lansing. We want priests serving in the area of giftedness, in the gift of supernatural effectiveness, so that our diocese can be everything that God wants it to be. Yeah, so what we mean by living in community uh, can mean both, on the one hand, living physically in community, living in the same rectory, or living in a, in a way in which they share common life. That is, they share common meals, they get together often, they, they pray together, they spend time together, they live life together, even if they might be living uh, separately. Why that's so important is, this is one, the vision of Jesus, he sends out, sends out the disciples not one by one, but two by two, right? This is the vision of the church at the Second Vatican Council, that priests are, are, are working together very closely. Um, but also, the reason is, is that priests need support. Priests cannot do this on their own. And there might be uh, a handful of priests who are very dynamic and very powerful, and they're able to, to do this more or less by themselves. But they're more the exception than, than the norm. And even then, I would propose to say those priests would even be more effective and more fruitful if they had a, a support structure to help them when the enemy attacks them, when the enemy discourages them, right? The fact is, is that we're about probably the most important business in the world, which is leading God's people to be the best versions of themselves and to evangelize and to bring Christ into the world. And if the enemy can pick one of us off, and often he does that by isolating us, then he's one. And so as priests support each other, we can prevent each other from falling into traps that cause us to be lonely or cause us to be vulnerable to the enemy. And we can all kind of rise to the occasion of leading the people of God. But when leadership fails, it's no surprise that the laity and the lay faithful grow discouraged. They feel lost and they end up falling away or going somewhere else. So this is all the more reason why as we as priests can support each other and living in common or having like fraternities or, or small groups or men's groups, that is, a, is a, an astounding and a, and a powerful way to keep us supported in our mission as priests of Jesus Christ.
Father Matthias Thalen there articulating that first principle of the Realign Resources to Mission process, that a healthy parish in the Diocese of Lansing is led by priests striving for health and holiness. Please do give us your comments upon what you have heard via the online survey. Remember, your hopes, fears, insights, and questions. Thank you for doing this. And so, on to the second principle of the Realign Resources for Mission Vision. Here it is, principle two. A healthy parish in the Diocese of Lansing equips and empowers parish staff. Here's an example of present staffing realities. The top area for growth identified by called for more key parish leader survey was more young people involved. And yet, just look at this graph. Only eight parishes highlighted in light green have a full-time youth minister. Meanwhile, 24 parishes denoted in yellow have no youth ministry provision at all. The rest, meanwhile, do something in between. Elsewhere, it's a similar story. Only one out of 72 parishes show a full-time marriage coordinator on staff. Our research also revealed a lack of team working. I think my parish pastor has a plan, but I don't know what it is, as said one staff member in a survey which found widespread affection for the clergy, but often a perceived lack of team working within parishes. I'm Deb Amato, and I am the Chief of Staff for the Diocesan Offices. I've been in that role for about three and a half years. Prior to coming to work in the Chancery, I worked in the parish. I was nine years working in the parish, um, predominantly working with RCIA, the process of RCIA. Uh, but I also helped out in the uh, Catholic school, teaching religion in uh, middle school at the parish where I was working. So as we were, as a committee, discerning what we thought a healthy parish would look like, you know, the first pillar that, that we focused on was you, you have to have good, strong, healthy leadership, striving for holiness. And so that first pillar was really focused on, on our pastors. But we really recognize that a pastor cannot do this work by himself. He's not called to do this work by himself. We are all called to be part of the mission through our, our baptism. So our second pillar to e equip and empower the, the uh, lay staff is really about um, ensuring that we surround our, our pastor with a competent, healthy, holy, uh, well-formed lay staff to accomplish the mission that, that we have here in our diocese. So, uh, you know, as we've done the research, as we've, you know, really, really looked around at other dioceses and, and what they're focusing on, I um, mean, as we looked at our own parishes, you know, it's really clear that um, our parishes, many of our parishes are struggling to be able to provide uh, just wages you know, for our staff. Uh, so there are many parishes that are really understaffed. And so you have beautiful, wonderful people who really want to, to help. They want to really be a part of the mission, sometimes wearing two and three and four different hats, you know, doing different jobs. Um, not and working a lot of hours and not necessarily for, for much money, which is wonderful and beautiful, but it's not a, a way to do ministry. Uh, they burn out quickly and they get tired, they get frustrated. Uh, and then many parishes, you know, even though it's, it's one of the things we've asked of parishes to be able to uh, provide formation for both the priest and for the, the laity, uh, many of them can't, their budget just doesn't allow them to really provide the appropriate formation for lay staff so that they can do their jobs well and, and feel competent in the work that they're doing. Uh, so this restructuring, this realigning resources for mission really is about aligning resources, providing uh, the ability financially for parishes to be able to hire lay staff, pay them well and keep them. I am very confident that the vision for a healthy parish that we discerned as a committee gives us the best chance at having our parishes become missionary in, in their focus. I think that we discerned well what a healthy parish should look like. So I'm confident that if we can, if we can implement this in a way that builds a healthy culture within the parish, within the staff, uh, and, and within the parishioners that we can actually 
have our diocese turned from maintenance to mission. I think we can be a missionary diocese with, with an enactment of this vision that we have discerned as a committee. That was Deb Amato. So how do those words play out in terms of a more detailed vision? Here's what Bishop Boyer and the Realign of Resources for Mission process think we should be able to say about our parishes in the years to come. That in the Diocese of Lansing, parishes hire the best and most competent people. Every defined critical ministry and role in a parish has a competent leader. Parishes have sufficient staff to fulfill the vision and mission. Those staff are paid competitively. Parish staff are a healthy team aligned to the mission and vision of the parish, while staff also receive ongoing formation, mentoring, and coaching. So, what do you think of that proposition? Again, tell us what you think courtesy of the online survey below. You may have worked in a parish yourself or still work in a parish or have observed closely how our parishes presently work and could work even better. We need to hear from you on principle two. A healthy parish in the Diocese of Lansing equips and empowers parish staff. Once again, thank you. Okay, now for the next principle of the Realign Resources for Mission process. Here it is, principle three. A healthy parish in the Diocese of Lansing makes and forms missionary disciples. Here's another gloomy graph. This is one of the questions you may remember being asked by the Disciple Maker Index, or DMI. It asks you to complete the following sentence. My parish equips me to talk to family and friends about sharing the story of Jesus. Those answers in blue, ranging from strongly agree on the left to strongly disagree on the right. And then a second question. My parish equips me to talk to friends and family about sharing my personal story. Those responses are in gray. Again, strongly agree on the left across to strongly disagree on the right. In summary, the results were strongly agree was 19 and 15% respectively to those questions, while the number who could not agree was 36% and 50%. Not surprisingly then, we see a similar trend in response to the second DMI question. In the past year, I shared my personal witness story with another person. The results of that were more often than quarterly, 17%. Quarterly, 12%. Once or twice per year, 36%. Never, 35%. So over 70% of us never or almost never share our personal witness story with another person. Greg Pohl, Director of New Evangelization. I am married to my lovely wife, Allison. We have six kids, Catherine, Thomas, Elizabeth, Hannah, Josephine, and Caroline. That's good. You know, they say it takes a... Uh, a town to, to raise a child. Um, you know, we are trying our best here in this home to raise our children with Christ at the center. Um, but it helps dramatically to have that reinforced when they go into their Catholic school, um, when they encounter other friendships and, um, you know, uh, develop relationships. It, it helps tremendously. I think what um, that Disciple Maker Index tells us is that we have a lot of people who love the Lord, um, but we have an environment in today's world that has sort of conditioned us to sort of keep that love quiet. Don't talk about it because, you know, there are basic rules. We don't talk about politics and religion at parties, right? Particularly family parties. But this is really important, that we renew this, uh, this um, common uh, uh, idea that um, it is paramount that we talk about our faith. Uh, and that's part of the, the evangelization movement that we really need to work on is equipping people to talk about their faith. What is the impetus of evangelization? It's clearly discipleship. One basic rule that is applied, you talk about what you love. You talk about what you love. You talk about what you invest yourself in. You're willing to put your neck on the line for the things you love, 
uh, for the things that you've invested time and energy into. And so when, when you have a true disciple, you can't stop them from evangelizing. It becomes uh, less of a sort of choreographed agenda, but it becomes more of a life agenda, uh, something fluid and dynamic that just comes out of someone's lived relationship with Jesus Christ. So the goal is to mobilize our parishes to create places where disciples can grow, disciples can find a home, a community, they need to be supported with other Christians. They need to be networked with other people who believe what we believe and who have given their lives for the same person of Jesus Christ. These are the really uh, foundational components that will actually create a, a historical movement in the church of evangelization. One thing that never changes, we always give the reason for our hope, as St. Peter said. We always must speak the gospel. We can't just simply um, hope that people will look at our lives and approach us someday and say, what, what makes you do what you do or what, what drives you? We actually have to give that reason up front to people, which is evangelization per se. My experience with this, I think, is very similar to a lot of people's experience with this. When we bring up Jesus Christ, when we share our experience of God, when we share with people that we'll pray for them, um, far more often people say thank you. People come around and say, I appreciate you sharing that with me, whatever it might be. Our reticence to share the gospel probably comes from something a little bit more that's just kind of in the air around us that says we're not supposed to talk about religion. That's not for the public square. We really need to rise above that and make it more of a, um, a consistent part of our daily conversations. Craig Pohl there. So what would that vision outlined in general by Craig look like if it became a reality in a parish within the Diocese of Lansing? We'd be able to observe or say there is much greater access to the sacraments and devotions than there are at present. That is more possible due to having more than one priest in each parish. Sacramental worship that is prayerful, reverent, beautiful, and powerful. Parishes have a discipleship process that moves people to spiritual maturity. They have processes for getting people serving others according to their gifts. Parishes have a vibrant community life. All parishes have a commitment to Catholic education. So, what do you think? Again, you can go to the online survey to give your opinion of Principle 3. A healthy parish in the Diocese of Lansing makes and forms missionary disciples. Of course, you don't have to give an instant response. Do feel free to take time to pray and ponder over each of these principles. Please do pray. And once again, thank you. And now for the final principle of the Realign Resources for Mission Vision. Here it is, the moment you've been waiting for. Principle four. A healthy parish in the Diocese of Lansing seeks the lost and serves the poor. How are we faring on that front in recent years? Let's look at the number of converts to Catholicism within the Diocese of Lansing in recent years. In 2003, there were 1,051 new Catholics. In 2009, there were 567 new Catholics. And in 2019, that was down to 319 new Catholics. That's a 70% drop in 16 years. At the same time, we've seen the rise of the nuns. No, not nuns, but nuns. You got that? That's those who answer none to the question of religious affiliation in both survey and census. They are America's fastest growing category of religious. In fact, among Michiganders, 24% say they are nuns, while 18% self-identify as Catholic. So, what is to be done? My name is Bert Schomberger, and I work for the Diocese of Lansing as the coordinator of lay ministry, and I also get to work uh, at the St. Francis Retreat Center as a pastoral associate. My thoughts first that are the first three prongs are great and they involve the clergy and the lay staff and the goal of what the parish is supposed to be doing, but really the parish is made up of the people. And so that seeking the lost and serving the poor is the work of every parishioner. It's what Jesus told us to do in spite of the fact that so many times in the gospel he'd do a miracle and then he'd say, don't tell anybody about me. 
I think he changed that in the end, and I think it's all of our job to go out and look for the poor and the lost. That's our job, every one of us. Um, 2020 made it really hard because the lost that were on the fringes got lost even further. Um, a pandemic and maybe the work of the evil one were more separated than we've ever been. But the lost really are the people that we miss seeing at Mass right now. The people in our families that we would love to see come back to the church. Um, they're out there and I think we're afraid right now to reach out to the lost. So our work is more important than ever. And the poor, the people who were poor, not just poor in spirit from being lost, but actually physically, socially, economically poor, are poorer now. So our work is more important. We've got more to do. I think we have to reach out and courage and do the work Jesus told us to do. The world is crying. Um, the death rate from deaths of despair, which is a horrible new term that we need to be familiar with. People who die from suicide. Somebody told me the other day that their nine-year-old granddaughter came home from school talking about suicide. Um, cirrhosis of the liver, in a, in a time when we have all the medicine to help people, they are not helping themselves. They're turning to all the wrong things. Opioid addiction, gambling, pornography. Um, we know, those of us who keep Christ a secret maybe, know that the answer is the hope that we find in Christ, in, uh, in the future, in heaven, in being saints on earth, in helping other people. I think the most important thing we can do is invite like Christ did. We have to witness with our lives that we have joy, that we're not living in despair, and that there's plenty of room at the table for everybody. There's enough Jesus to go around, right? We can't attract people to someone we don't know. And we need to know the person of Jesus Christ. The way to do that is through prayer. And very often an efficacious way to get closer to him is through fasting and almsgiving. We're serving the poor as we um, grow closer to Christ ourselves. We can't give what we don't have. So we as apostles, we as intentional disciples, as parishioners, as Catholics, need to know the Lord through scripture, through prayer, um, and through works of mercy, which is what he's called us to do. Thank you, Bert Schoenberger. That's the overall vision. In terms of details, though, we should be able to say that in the Diocese of Lansing, parishes have designated processes to evangelize their local community. They prioritize spiritual and corporal works of mercy in those communities. They instill a shared responsibility by all members for the mission of seeking the lost and serving the poor. Parishes are invested and recognizable in their local community as salt, light, and leaven. They offer easy and accessible entry points for unbelievers to encounter Christ. That is, they provide ways for people to find out more about Jesus and his holy church without having to sign up immediately for RCIA or baptism. So that's the concluding principle of the Realign Resources for Mission process. A healthy parish in the Diocese of Lansing seeks the lost and serves the poor. Again, we need and want to hear your hopes, fears, insights, and questions via the online survey. Well, in the coming weeks, the Realign Resources for Mission Committee will gather and evaluate all the feedback from the parish meetings. We'll then continue to work towards multiple models of restructuring. How are we going to do that? Watch this. My name is Deacon Devin Wolf. I'm from St. Mary Magdalene Parish in Brighton. And for the past 34 years of my career, I've been in retail location research. So what I do primarily for a day job is I help retailers figure out where to strategize locations and markets, looking at demographics and traffic and all kinds of other things, and um, basically help them to make decisions. This process, one of the great things about it is it's one of those places that I get to marry my avocation as a deacon and my day job, which for me is very exciting because I do a lot of work helping people to figure out how to get people how to buy, buy more stuff, but helping people how to meet Jesus, that's ultimately very rewarding. So I'm able to take the skills that I use in my day job and use them tr in a transferable way to help the diocese understand better where it is that we need to move in our resources and where people are coming from, where they live, um, and then where we have opportunities, opportunities to grow in the diocese and grow the kingdom of God.
we were using a bunch of different things. One of them, of course, is we know where everybody in the diocese lives. We know how far parishes draw people, so maybe it's 15 minutes here or 10 minutes there. We know that parishes overlap each other in their congregations, and so we can see all of that. And then we combine all that up with demographic data um, that tells us about where there's areas of growth uh, or decline in the diocese so far as demography, so far as population. Um, and we also look and use tools like I mentioned, drive times and, and looking at the, the parish boundaries to be able to kind of figure out where everything lays out and you know maybe where it is that we've got an opportunity to do more. Step three will then see Deacon Devon and the rest of the committee present various models to the priests of the diocese in the first quarter of 2021. We'll then return to each region of the diocese to present these models to parishes. And only after that will we present a final report with recommendations to Bishop Boyer after Easter 2021. That is why we are so grateful for you for taking the time to watch this video, to listen, to read, and to write in response to our online survey. As said, we will read everything you submit. It will be invaluable in generating those concrete proposals, which will come back to you for comment next year. Thank you. God bless you. And just as we began with prayer, let us also conclude with prayer. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Holy Mary, conceived without sin, patroness of the Diocese of Lansing, pray for us.